All right, good morning again. Good morning. We are at the door. We, as a church, are on the very threshold. We are, so to speak, at the bank of the Jordan River, ready to cross. And we are on the very brink of entering in. Entering in. You might be wondering, what, what are we entering into? What are we at the door of, right? Entering into what? I believe the Lord has been moving at an accelerated, rapid pace to bring us to this position right now at this time. And he is going to prepare, and he's preparing us to step into his calling and his plans and his purposes for our church. I think over the last 18 years, it's been 18 years since we started Catalyst, it's almost as if the Lord has had us in this giant incubator. He's kind of had us hidden away in this incubator where he's been stirring, where he's been moving, where we've been learning. The Spirit has been teaching us different things about identity, about the Holy Spirit, about worship, about all these different things. He's had us in this incubator. But I think now he's saying, it's birthing time. It's birthing time. It's time for you as a church family to step forward in faith into my vision, my calling, and my purposes of why I created Catalyst. So it's very exciting. Basically, essentially, in a nutshell, it has to, part of it has to do with our mission statement and our mission. Our mission is right here to help people experience all God created and call them to be in Christ. We want every single person, every one of you, our family, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, we want everyone to experience who God made them to be, what their purpose is for their life, and to step into that. And that all starts with Jesus Christ. And so that's our mission. But the vision the Lord has been putting on our hearts is, is this, to be a city on a hill from Matthew 5, that he's calling us to be birthed, to be a city on a hill. What does that mean? A place, number one, a place where God's presence dwells. That's the most important. That distinguishes us from any other organization, group, um, you know, school, anything. It's the presence of the Lord. And so we want a place where God's presence dwells, where we grow stronger together as a family. I was just so blessed. I, I hadn't looked on the Team Reach app for a couple of weeks, and then I, I, it's on a, another screen, so I went to the screen, and went, oh my gosh, I got 20 notifications. So I looked, and I saw like pickleballs, you know, there's like 18 to 20 people every week at pickleball. I saw DM, I saw your hike, and I saw this group of women on this hike. I saw all these activities. I thought, I, I love it when you, I see everyone out there on this grass quad, and you could sense the Lord building community, becoming stronger together. And so we want to continue to do that. And then three, we want to be the place where we can be a light to impact the community. And, and specifically, I think some of that impact is going to be in the Long Beach area or the surrounding area. Now, as far as a place, I'm not ready to make an announcement yet. <laughs> but soon. But soon. I think I'm up to... 98% sure that we're going to get a place. It's close. It's very close. We're actually in discussions about actually signing the lease. They're actually drawing up 
the lease as we speak. So very soon, but I don't want to say anything until that ink is on that lease. We know we got the place, okay? But the, the visions, how, I, I'm so, I, I, I almost can't help myself. I want to tell you the stories of how God has been unfolding this. And with each delay, there's been a blessing out there like, oh my gosh, God's doing something. Oh my gosh, God's doing something. It's, it's, it's amazing. And it's because I think God is ready to birth us. He's ready to birth us. He's orchestrating things. He's preparing things for us as to step in, just as he prepared things for Israel to step in to their calling into the promised land. So for us, what's our part? We have to prepare to move forward. We have to be mentally, emotionally, or volitionally ready and in spirit especially to move forward in faith. And so today, we're, that's why we're starting this new series. This new series, From Fear to Faith, Preparing to Step In. From Fear to Faith, Preparing this step to step in. During this season, God has continually been bringing back to my mind the whole story of, of Israel being, you know, from the Exodus, being freed from bondage, 400 years of slavery in, in Egypt, and going, and then bringing them to the brink of stepping in to the promised land. And that promise was way, way back from Genesis chapter 12, when God originally promised to Abraham, Abraham that he would be the father of a great nation, that they would have a place and a land, and they would be blessed so that they could be a blessing to all the nations. And so God had brought them to the brink of fulfillment. And God tells Moses to send out spies, scouts, to check out the land. So here we have Numbers 13, 1 through 2. The Lord said to Moses, send out men to explore the land of Cana, the land I am giving to the Israelites. So this is land that God was providing for them. He was giving it to them. Send one leader from each of the 12 ancestral tribes. So they were to check out the land to see is this good land? Is it fruitful land? And to also assess the strength of the people who were there in the land. Because even though God was giving it to them, even though God was going before them, even though God said he's going to drive out the people, the Israelites had to take possession. They had to move forward. They had to act in faith to possess the land. That's how it is spiritually. God has given us all these things. Ephesians says God has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place, but we have to lay hold of it. We have to grab hold of it in faith to make it a reality in our experience. And so he said, check out the land. Check out the land that I'm about to give you. And so they, they went, they checked out the land, and they came back, and everything was in place. Everything was set. It was their moment. This would be the fulfillment of God's calling to his people. It kind of reminded me, as I was thinking about this and praying reading, it reminded me of the movie Rudy. You guys know that movie Rudy? That football? I, I love that movie. Every time I watch it, I get teary. I go, Rudy, right? Because he was a small, it's based on a true story too. He was a small, kind of marginally athletic guy that was, you know, that had this dream to play football for Notre Dame. And at that time, Notre Dame was the football place. Right? It was the powerhouse. And he wanted to play football for Notre Dame. And he had to overcome incredible odds, incredible doubts, incredible people coming against him. And Rudy rose up, right? 
And he made it to, he made it because his grades were terrible. He made it into the school. He made it on the practice squad. And it's his moment. He has the Notre Dame gear on, and he's getting ready to run out that tunnel for the very first time, actually playing on the Saturday team. Because you're not officially part of the team unless you get to run out and be part of the Saturday actual game team. So he's ready to run out. And here's a picture of him, ready to run out in the tunnel. And the captain, the captain of the team grabs his, grabs his face mask and he says, you ready, champ? And he says, I've been ready my whole life. Israel had been ready their whole life for the promised land. In fact, not just their life, it had been centuries and centuries and centuries of waiting. Generation after generation after generation of waiting. Generations had come and gone, come and gone, come and gone. But this was a generation. They were at the very edge of the Jordan River. They could see across the river the promised land that God had promised. Everything was set. And a train wreck. Everything got derailed. What happened? Two of the spies said, it's awesome land. Let's go take it. Joshua and Caleb, full of faith. Ten of the spies gave a bad report. And because of these 10 spies and what they sowed into the people, Israel had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And worse than that, every person 20 years and older that was on the brink of experiencing the fulfillment of God's promise that had, they had been waiting for for generations. Every person 20 years and older, because of the fear and the disobedience and the attitude of the spies and the people, God says, that generation you are not going to step foot in the land. You are not going to experience my promise to your people. What was so egregious about the report, the attitude of the 10 spies? And what can we learn from them? Well, there's one primary lesson. We can learn one primary lesson that I'm going to talk about today. And it's this. When fears are not faced, it leads to doubt and disobedience, which are fatal to faith. When fears are not faced, it leads to doubt and disobedience, which are fatal to faith. And the Bible in Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Pleasing God, walking with God, experience God. It's all based on faith. And so if fear and our unwillingness, lack of courage to face our fears gets in the way, 
it can stifle, limit, shut down, kill our faith. Let's look at Numbers 13, 31. Caleb has just said, let's take the land. It's an awesome, good land. They even back fruit. They brought back fruit from the land. It was awesome fruit and produce. He says, let's take the land. This is what the ten said. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land amongst the Israelites. The land we traveled through and we explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. The spies were afraid. And we might think, okay, humanly, rightly so. They saw giants in the land. The cities were strong and fortified. All this stuff. But instead of facing their fears, instead of confronting their fears, Instead of confessing and helping each other overcome their fears, they stirred up fear in the people. And then look what happens. Numbers 14. Then the whole community began weeping aloud, and they cried all night. They were on the edge. They were on the brink. They were on the door of experiencing the fulfillment of God's promise. And here they are, because the spies stir up fear, they're crying, they're weeping, they're moaning, they're complaining. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. They start turning on their leaders. This is one reason why we're addressing this. I don't want you to turn on your leaders. <laughs> they turn on their leaders. If only we had died in Egypt, or even here in the wilderness, they complained. You know, I just heard this from Bill Johnson. He said, complaining is the language of fear. Complaining is the language of fear. And the fear is the opposite of faith. Guess whose language you're agreeing with and speaking when you're complaining? It's not that guy. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better if we return to Egypt? They're on, they're on the doorstep of the promised land. They were this chosen generation to be able to step in. Then they plotted among themselves, let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. Fear is dangerous and deadly. It creates doubt and unbelief. You know, you know to God what's the worst sin of all? Unbelief. Unbelief. Unbelief is what sends people to hell. Because they would rather not believe and submit to God. And God grants them their wish. Fear leads to doubt and unbelief. It can cause disobedience to God. It can keep us from God's calling and his destiny and his glory that he has for us. And this is the thing. Just a few people that are stirring up fear, that are feeding fear, can stop 
a nation and potentially keep our whole church from entering into God's plan. Look what fear did to them, that verse we just read. Fear totally distorted their thinking. They said in verse 2, they said, if only we had died in... Let's see. Uh, Oh, if only we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness. They said, it's better if we're dead than than to have to face our fears. What? Rather than facing your fear, it's better if you were dead? Fear totally distorted their thinking and perceptions. And then they thought, and they feared, and they totally turned their back on God. Turning their back on God was better than facing their fears. It says in verse 3, Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Essentially, they're accusing God of setting them up so he could kill them. Crazy. He's the one that's feeding the manna every day in the wilderness, parted the Red Sea before them, had his presence come down, is leading them with the cloud by day and a fire by night. He's going to go through all that just so they can take him into the promised land and kill them. That's what fear does. That's what fear does. Let me just say this. When we are fearful, it's okay in the sense that it's an emotion we we need to acknowledge. And when we're fearful, it is okay to question, ask questions of God. It is okay, it is right, it is, it is fine. It's actually part of being intimate with God. When we are fearful, when we are doubting, we are question, it's okay to ask questions of God, about, uh, of God, ask him questions. But never question God's character. We can ask him questions, but don't question his character. They were saying God, you plotted to murder us. Never, ever attribute to God the attributes of Satan. You could ask God questions. You could express your grievances. You could lament. Don't question God's character. Don't attribute things to God that are characteristics of Satan. You know, Pastor Robert says there are two kinds of people in this world. (laughs) Where, Well, there are three kinds of fear in the world. There's a healthy fear. Fear of petting a lion. That's a healthy fear. Fear of touching a hot stove. That's a healthy fear. That's a God-given fear to warn us not to do something. There is a bad fear. That's the kind of fear that the Israelites were stoking. The fear that leads to doubt, that leads to unbelief, that leads to blaspheming, mocking God, or attributing to God something that's attributed to Satan. Then then there's the good fear. You know what the good fear is? Fear of the Lord. A healthy honoring and respect. He is the potter. We are the clay. He is God Almighty. 
we are not. The Bible verses we've been reading through, right, in our Bible reading, Proverbs, what does it say in Proverbs? The beginning of wisdom is what? Fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord. And because of fear, lasty, they thought the security and comfort of being a slave and in bondage and treated badly, the security and comfort of that in Egypt was better than having to face their fears and take the promised land. If you hold things like comfort, like security above the Lord, If you hold comfort and security above stepping out in faith and pursuing God's calling, if you hold your comfort and security higher than honoring and following the Lord and obeying Him, you know what that's called? An idol. It's an idol. No better than the idolatry that the Israelites played the harlot, committed adultery in their relationship with God. Matthew 10, 37 and 39. If you love your father or mother, more than you love me, think about that. You are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, to your comfort, to your securities, to your plans, to your possessions, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. You will find life. You will find the life you were meant to have you will find the best life of all that God has saved you and called you to experience. God, let me tell you, God has prepared us, is preparing things behind the scenes, orchestrating things to take us from here to here, right now. He's doing that. It will increase your life. He will cause us together to bear much fruit. You know, I got this image one time. And it was this whole idea of us bearing fruit. And I got this picture of Jesus. And I saw Jesus had this big old old, juicy fruit. And he just bit into that thing and the juice was running down his face and he was beaming and he was smiling and he was even laughing. It was like he was experiencing himself. Oh, right? And then I realized when we bear fruit he gets to enjoy it seeing the pleasure 
and the joy on his face because of fruit that we bear. It's nothing better than that because of all that Jesus has done for us. We have to say, we have to face our fears. And in faith, say yes. Yes, Lord. Yes. We will step in. We will move forward. We will sacrifice. We will pay the price because you have prepared something great for us. Are we willing to face our fears? Are we willing to say yes if it means less comfort, less security, less in our bank accounts? Are we willing to say yes if it requires some significant changes to our lifestyle, to how we spend our time, to what we put and use our time for? Are we willing to say yes to get help finally and sign up for a prayer ministry session? I want, to, I, want you, I want to ask, will you please raise your hand if you have received prayer ministry, like signed up and received prayer ministry from one of the prayer ministry teams? Can you raise your hand? Raise it up high. Look. Keep it up high. Look. Look, look, look. All these people. And I bet if you talked to any one of them, they said it was good, right? Breakthrough. Fear is broken. Bondage is... Would you be willing to say yes to face your fears and face some of those issues from your past? Yes, from your childhood, from some traumas you might have experienced because it's affecting your life. It's affecting your ability to follow the Lord. Are you willing to say yes if it means letting go to your dreams and the dreams that you have for your children and consecrate your kids, their future, their safety, their health? Consecrate them to the Lord. There is so much power released when a group of people together say yes. Say yes. I'm just going to close with this. I remember this was several, quite a number of years ago. Uh, I was having, uh, I was meeting Don Hirata for a meal. And we were, I remember it, we were meeting at Panera Bread. And I remember Don was kind of wrestling. We were talking about this idea of God's voice, hearing his voice, and, and hearing and feeling and sensing God's promptings. And Don was just kind of wrestling with it, kind of wrestling, wrestling, like, yeah, I'm not sure, da-da-da. I, I questioned, da-da-da. He was, we were talking, and... Um, and then as we were talking, I say, well, maybe you have to say yes. Whatever you sense is from the Lord, just say yes. Just say yes to it. Because the posture of our heart affects God speaking to us, our ability to hear him, and experiencing his power in our lives. So we kind of discussed it for a while, and he said, okay, okay, I'm going to do it. I, and I can't remember the time frame. It's like the next six months. 
any sense prompting I sense from the Lord, I'm going to just say yes. That six months led him on the crazy adventure. It started him on this crazy adventure with the Lord, walking with the Lord. It led him to hang out with him and Nick Wogan with the Maasai tribe in Africa. It, it led him to baptizing members of the Maasai tribe in this cow pond where there was leeches in there. And people, when they would get baptized, they started manifesting demonic manifestations. It led him to giving a sermon at a pastor's conference of African pastors. He spoke. And it changed his life. And it elevated his faith. God is preparing us to bring us to the edge and he's going to ask, will you say yes? Will you say yes? And for the next several months, we are going to prepare so together we could say yes and step into God's future, God's blessing, God's power, God's provision, to be a city on a hill, to be stronger together, to be a place where God's presence is inhabiting us so that we can be a light, a blessing, to the community around us. Let's bow forward prayer. Lord, I, I know that I know that I know that you are moving and orchestrating and working and you've been setting things up and you are positioning us, God, as a church family to step in, literally and figuratively. And you have awesome things prepared that you've prepared for us before we were even born, before even time. You foresaw this. And you bringing us to the brink. Holy Spirit, would you just move and stir and uh, break strongholds? Would you give us, stir in us courage and resilience and fight and determination, Lord, that we will face those fears? because you are with us, because you go before us, because you are a good God that has good things ahead of us. And so, Lord, do just do a supernatural work. Holy Spirit, we say, we say, activate, 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 stir. And Lord, it, are, it is our desire to please you, to love you, to demonstrate our love by our obedience to you. That you might get all the glory and all the praise and all the worship, not only from us, but from those that we encounter. Because Lord, you alone are worthy.
Thank you, Lord. We want to bless you now and worship in Jesus' name. Amen.